Our next section here is down markers, which I've called down and distance. And this is not something that we're gonna overuse, but it is an important thing to talk about because shot strategically at the right moments, it can really help a viewer understand what's going on in the game. And the first rule we're gonna talk about with down markers is to use it when you think that the audience would be unsure of what down it is. So if a team has a first down and they run for three yards, we know it's second down, no reason to film it. Then if they run for four more yards, we know it's gonna be third down, we don't need to show the audience that it's third down. Then they throw an incomplete pass, we know that it's fourth down, we don't need to show the sticks with fourth down. We just have to remember that they're gonna be punting, and we're gonna pay attention and film the punt, if you can remember that. So now they kick again, the team punts, and the other team gets the ball, they hit a 50 yard pass, we know it's first down, there's no reason to film it. So you can use this kind of logic to help you know when to film the down markers. A great way to use the down markers is during a pivotal third or fourth down play. And what I like to do is get a shot of the down marker showing that it's third or fourth down, and then slowly pull out to reveal the play pre-snap like we would in any other situation. This adds a little drama to the play, especially on fourth down. You show the stick and it says fourth down. You slowly pull out, it builds a little tension and suspense that this is fourth down. Here comes the fourth down play. So again, start close on the stick and try to time your camera move so that you can pull back and by the time you are fully wide and can see all the players, you're four or five seconds away from a snap. It's a great way to use it. It enhances the game situation and it keeps you from having to do two shots, one of the sticks and one of the play. You have it all wrapped up in one. I wanted to group something else in this section on down markers because I'm not really sure where else to put it and that is when there is an official measurement when a team is very close to a first down and the referees have to bring out the sticks to measure it. Well, in the previous section on penalties, we talked about not rolling until the referee is about to make the call. And in this case, we wanna do the same thing. If you see the ball placed down and the referees coming onto the field with the chains, we don't wanna film them running out onto the field with the chains. That's something that we would fast forward through. What we want is the result. So as soon as the referee puts the first of the sticks down and gets ready to pull the other one out to measure, we can start rolling. Get a nice tight shot of the ball and the sticks so we can see where the chain is in relation to the ball and boom, the referee puts the stick down and we can see exactly what's going on. Then you wanna widen out and if it's a first down, you'll see the referee make the call. If not, he might say third and inches and that's a good time to also film the down markers because now that they have not made a first down, let's remind the audience of what down it is to see if they're going to get the first down. The best rule to abide by with down markers is kind of the same thing we talked about with scoreboards. If you're watching the game through your camera and you feel like you wouldn't know what down it is if you were watching at home, that's a good time to shoot the sticks. So use that as your biggest judgment, but you can also enhance the situation like we talked about with fourth downs, but always make sure the audience is aware of what down it is if it's not obvious. And if you do that, you're once again helping coaches and people watching understand the game situation, and that's the best time to shoot extras. So let's use that and move on to the next section on extras. In this final video of the section, we're gonna talk about what I call bookends and more. Bookends, of course, are things that happen before and after the game. And the more part is a couple of things that I couldn't really find a good spot for in the body of the course, so I'm gonna mention them here. So we're gonna throw a couple of different things at you, and then we'll be done with this section and we'll move on to some other ways to film like sideline and end zone. But let's start with the bookends. Bookends, again, are those things at the beginning and the end of the game. And you know, I mentioned earlier that we don't wanna shoot things that we would fast forward through. So you might find it a contradiction when I say that we should always film the coin toss at the beginning of the game. All right, and I would suggest doing that unless you have a coach who hired you who said don't bother. But the coin toss might be an important thing to film. It allows us to see who won the toss, how they chose which side of the field to take, and so on. And the bottom line with a coin toss is because it's the very first play, the very first shot on your camera, if somebody doesn't want it there, it's really easy to delete it. They don't have to dig through the game to find a shot of say a band that you took in the middle of the second quarter. If they wanna not use your coin toss, they can simply find the first shot on your camera and delete it. Or if they're uploading to an online service like Huddle or Crossover, they can very easily leave the first play out and have the first shot be your kickoff. So there's no harm in filming the coin toss. It's a nice way to get into the game and to communicate information. So I would recommend filming it unless you've been told otherwise. 
Now at the end of the game, you can see in my picture behind me that we have a handshake. And I think a handshake in the same way that the coin toss is a nice way to get into the game, the handshake is a nice way to go out. It also shows sportsmanship, which we all know is very important. But there's two things that you should do at the end of the game. You should definitely film the scoreboard so that we know the final score and that we can see the clock reading zero and that the game is over, and then the handshake. If you don't do either of them, there might be some confusion as to whether the game is even over. I've actually had cameramen before who didn't do either ending shot, and someone took a handoff and got tackled, and the screen went black, and that was it. And you have no idea if that's the way your game ends. You have no idea that the game is actually over. So you need to do one or two shots at the end of the game to communicate the score, to show your sportsmanship, and kind of wrap it up. I usually pull out from a uh, handshake. I usually start tight and widen out, and then just hold for a few seconds, fade to black. It's a good way to end the game after 40 minutes to an hour uh, of game footage. So those are your bookends. Now the more part. And the first thing we're going to talk about here is uh, fights. Sometimes after a play, you know, this is football. It's a contact sport. People are hitting each other hard. Sometimes players will go at it. You'll see a few shoves, maybe a punch, or they'll exchange words. And what I want to say about fights is that we always film fights. And I didn't always feel this way. We would cut it out. We didn't want to put violence on our tape. But there's an important, real, uh, important reason why we want to film fights. And that is because people want to review it later. Uh, coaches, referees want to look and see who was the instigator. There might be a punishment or a suspension in order. Uh, they're going to look to the cameraman. The first person they're going to call after the game is the cameraman asking, did you get that fight? So if you see one, you have to film it. Um, you have to widen out to see everybody who might be involved. Is there somebody throwing a punch on the outside? Um, you want to get everybody who could be involved in the fight so you can see the whole big picture. Um, at the end of a play, if you see people jawing at each other, or potentially you feel like there might be a punch thrown, don't cut. We talk about letting a play breathe and holding on it long enough. We definitely don't want to cut before a punch gets thrown because we don't want to miss it. So it's okay to hold on a shot if you see two players starting to talk trash to each other. I would say keep rolling because you never know what's going to happen. Again, err on the side of shooting too much. Don't err on the side of missing something. Okay? So always film fights. Finally, here we're going to talk about injuries. Football, of course, is a violent game. People get hurt. And when they do, sometimes it's a serious injury and there's a long delay in the game. Sometimes a player has to get taken off with a stretcher or carried off. Uh, we don't really want to film injuries to that degree. If anybody's hurt seriously, I don't roll at all. I just, we see the kid on camera getting hurt. I cut at the normal time. Next thing we see is the play. The only time I roll longer on injuries is when we see that the player is okay. Maybe if he's helped off the field or he walks off under his own power, it's always nice to show good news as opposed to bad news. So if you see an injury, there's no reason to roll on something, no reason to roll to the, on the medical staff tending to him for a long time. I would almost ignore it unless it was obvious that it happened. You can hold on it for a few extra seconds. Don't treat it any differently. Maybe show the player walking off that he's fine. Otherwise, just move on to the next play. So now we've gotten through everything from filming a game from up above the press box or somewhere in the bleachers. We've done running and passing, we've done special teams, and now we've done all the extras. So the remaining videos in this course are going to talk about what happens if you have other situations, like when it's raining, or when you're forced to film from the sidelines or even from the end zone, how to handle those different types of views. But hopefully over these last series of videos, you now know how to set up your camera up high, elevated and centered, and shoot everything you need, any situation that comes up in the game so you can do it properly. So congrats on making it this far, and I'll see you in the last couple of sections where we talk about these other situations that you might be shooting in, and then you'll have made it. You'll be a professional sports videographer. See you in the next video.